All right, I'm ready to rock and roll. I may get the tambourine out in a minute, start entertaining. Yes, so if you would just stop me a little stop that, you know, the light is uh, on Facebook. I hope I'm not cutting up my head. So uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to another online session. Uh, so tonight's session uh, will focus on reading uh, using uh, stories. Uh, what a beautiful combination! So reading with stories. So in this very interesting uh, session, we will discover uh, uh, the power of reading uh, uh, with, uh, with stories. Uh, so we have Rita. So good evening, Rita. How are you? I'm great. To see you again. Great. Thank you. Glad to see you. Great. So, uh, as I said, the session will focus on reading. So, uh, I'm sure it will be a fun session. Uh, so, Rita, welcome to Everyone Academy. So, uh, and uh, you can, uh, if you want, uh, introduce the session and then uh, start talking about uh, reading and stories. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm going to check uh, the volume again one more time. Everybody, uh, is that okay? You can hear me okay? Yes, yes. All right, yes. now we're ready to go. Uh, I know I'm supposed to introduce myself a little bit, and that's the, the least of what I want to do with you today. If, if you haven't met me before, I've been around a long time. Uh, I've actually been teaching one level or another, one way or another, for 50 years now. And so please don't do the math. I was in the classroom at about eight years old and it'll feel better than if you add it that way. Um, I was a school principal, a curriculum consultant for County Office of Education in Sacramento, California. Um, I made house calls to nearly 600 classrooms teaching with teachers. And as a result of that, it was really, uh, really great. We uh, wrote a, a book and had some videos and things done at the time. So this is the book I'm uh, redoing right now. It's 
in pre-publication. I'm really excited about that because it's going to give uh, everybody hands-on things to do right off the bat. And my other book, uh, Reading Champs, is still up on Amazon. This is a neat how-to sleeper. You don't have to read the whole thing. You just pick out the mini lessons. And the other book that I recently wrote was Stories from Teacher's Heart, which is a beautiful, beautiful book, uh, Motivate and Inspire You. And that was in 19. So pretty much I've been uh, teaching, traveling, training, keynoting for most of my life, um, it seems. And yet there's always so much more that I need to know. And I am not a technology expert. I barely can get on Zoom. So once I'm on Zoom, then we can Zoom. But I want to make sure that everybody understands that I am not claiming to be uh, anything to do with technology or math. Uh, I didn't even have the right time for Morocco. I was ready this morning at 10 a.m. Just shows how good, uh, how well I converted. So what do I do? Sometimes I wonder. But what I do really well on that is teach reading because I've been doing it a long time all over the place. The only time that I wasn't um, actively in the classroom um, or teaching um, university for a bit was when I took care of my ill husband. And even during that time, uh, I did manage to go back and teach college for three universities. And I was teaching uh, uh, kids at our historic home and property. And I was also doing special appearances. And then after moving to Oregon, I ended up going back in the classroom. I was writing actively, uh, finishing another book, but I decided to be a preschool teacher. I wanted to know if I could do it. Really, it was different. I'd been a preschool principal, but not a preschool teacher. The other thing that I've been doing in the last few years, um, the last two out of the classroom for the first time, really, um, I've been a, a featured um, writer for BAM Internet Radio. I have 134 blogs posted under Edwards and I actually sent a, a Z's, uh, 17 that I thought might be useful as follow up if you wanted to read some of what I've written about reading. So that being said, I'm not going to tell you everything I've done, it would take a while and I'm not bragging about it, I'm in such humility because now I know that there's so much more to know and the pendulum has been swinging hard again. The reading wars have gone on for so long. How we could even worry about the differences between uh, a battle over a whole language phonics or uh, whether to use cueing or whether to use this. I don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. So what I tell you today in this session, maybe something different than what you thought or what you've heard, but I'll bet most of the time I'm just validating what you already know or what you've already done. And that will make me feel good because I know sometimes we get overwhelmed with change coming from here and from here and from here. And a year like this, when we shouldn't be doing standardized testing or checking the fluency to the point that the kids are crying and we've got to tone it down, mellow it down and have some fun. So the one thing that struck uh, when I met with you Aziz before was you said that, that kids weren't uh, having fun when they were reading that you wanted to make it more fun. And here you wrote a book about grammar games already. So I thought and thought and thought about what to present for today. And I, I like the idea of today uh, focusing more on um, decoding and recognizing new words. And if I get a little bit into more comprehension, that'd be great. If not, we'll do that in the next session. But for today, I want, today I want to start with something that I actually wrote and was in my um, book that I thrust out at you, my memoirs. And this was called Circle Time Funny Story. And it, and it starts off like this. I absolutely love teaching in the preschool. And the reason that I had to stop was I was, I was ill with cancer. I was, uh, God bless that I was able to go finish that year. And uh, the literacy grant was phenomenal. I, I learned so much about how to teach emergent kids how to read. But one of the books that, and again, I'm hoping we won't have glare. Um, one of the books that I did right off the bat was Everybody Cooks Rice with the Kids. And this was really neat. I mean, you do have a compound word. As we go, I'm gonna be sharing some ideas about how we can use some trade books and some books besides regular reading programs to inspire children to want to read more with the variety that we share with them. This is a neat book. It does have has a compound word right in there, everybody 
But as I'm going to share when we get to compound words, I wouldn't start with everybody because what's in everybody? I like to start with concretes. In fact, I'm really big about using stuff from around the house to teach with props and realia and actuals. So here's the book we started with and I had chopsticks with the kids and we were uh, uh, picking up uh, pom-poms and, and uh, raisins and things. And then um, I, I gotta tell you the whole story though. And this is how it goes. I read the book, Everybody Cooks Rice and Brought Chopsticks. We use them to sort, count, pick up raisins, which of course got eaten. That day for lunch, I brought Japanese food, including seaweed salad. And the two-year-old kept asking about it, but wouldn't, wouldn't taste any, of course. But they were always into my lunch. Every day after that, for several weeks, the children would ask when I came into the school, what's in your pockets today, Rita? Was it a bean bag? Uh, could it be a floating eyeball? Who knows what's going to be in my pocket? And then they'd say, did you bring seaweed salad today, Rita? So right before Christmas vacation, I brought a large carton of seaweed salad and the teachers knew the joke. So they asked me to put the seaweed salad on the children's plates first. And a few kids tried it and they go, ew, I'm not going to eat that seaweed salad. But the couple who did, they really, really loved it. and They ate a lot of it. So lunch was served quickly. Then when one of the little girls thought that seaweed salad was all that she was going to get. And so they were very, very relieved when they got their regular lunch. For many years, Art Linkletter had a show about what children said that was really, really funny. And it was called, kid, that segment was called Kids Say the Darndest Things. And I like to tell stories like, oh, Rita, hmm, I don't know how to answer that. And I'd say, all right, just answer this. What's your mommy's name? And the child would say, mommy. So there's stories everywhere. We all have a story. The children have stories and they have stories now about what life has been like in the last year or so for them, which was very different. So stories are, are everything. Stories make us who we are. We become people who might, we might wanna be. We see places that we might wanna go, things that we, we might wanna do. We fall in love with characters. Now, we're talking stories, but we're looking that there are stories not just in fiction or narrative, but also in nonfiction. But what I wanted to share next was a book called Aunt Flossie's Hats. And the reason that I'm very, very partial to this book, besides all the cool things I can teach, like uh, possessives, and I can also teach word family, hat and hats. But what struck me about this is this story brought me back to my, my childhood and my mother who was very big on hats. When she passed away, there were so many hats. We split them up with the girls and the family and I'll show you some hats in a minute. So here's what happened. The kids went to see the grandma and what happened there? They had their tea party and they got to try on Aunt Flossie's hats. And then they got to eat crab cakes later too. So that was fun. So I thought, what if I showed you why I like that book? Um, I got some of my mom's hats here. So this one is really funny. I'm not going to put it on because I'll, I'll laugh at myself too hard. And then I wanted to show you that people really did have cat boxes like in Aunt Flossie's hat. And when they got into her hat boxes, my daughter and I we used to get into my mother's and we would see all these hats and we put them on and, and oh, this, was a, this one's a corker. Imagine, imagine wearing a hat like that. Wow, that, that just blew me away. So stories that have things in common to our life are stories that I like to start with. And the reason that I think it's really important is that we want to make sure that things that are around us are all considered as stories. So as I was thinking today, what, what did I really wanna share with you with the idea that um, I was asked to talk about reading through stories? So I decided, first of all, I had to figure out what might we review. And so I came up with pretty simple, uh, phonemic awareness right off the bat. We, we always need to know the sounds of the letters. 
before we can go too far, especially if we have second language learners. The second component of five components of reading would be phonics. And with science of reading making a, a, a big splash right now, um, we've been talking about ev evidence-based reading and uh, brain-based reading for a long time. So that's nothing new for me and it really isn't new for you either. Fluency, I am a very big believer in teaching a lot about fluency. Uh, to date, we used to say that fluency was just being an automatic reader. In other words, we could decode the words. And I'd like to stop for a second and just say if uh, you were trained or taught the old way we call the train today, where we're taught or we share, we learn in our staff development. Um, but still, I still see the words word attack. We need to stop that. I'd rather prefer us uh, looking at decoding or uh, word recognition as the, the big picture here, because we are not attacking words. Now, what we're talking about today goes from preschool all the way through adults. This is not anything just for babies, not anywhere near. I've been in high school classes where I uh, worked on words at the board and I'd say, well, uh, how many syllables does it have? And the kids play right along. Kids like to have fun. Doesn't matter what age they are. So fluency becomes really, really important to me because I tie that in with rate building and then ultimately toward the beginnings of speed reader. One of the reasons that I push so hard on uh, fluency is because the slower that a student reads, the more uh, readily they will forget what they read. The faster that they read, as long as they're not just word calling and they're getting the words, they're gonna remember better. So it ties together. Vocabulary is another of the five major components. So we have phonemic awareness, we have phonics, we have, um, Fluency, we have vocabulary, and the fifth major component would be what? Comprehension. So with that being said, I'm starting this morning with you with the idea of what stories are all around us. We all have a story. Um, we may start with Everybody Cooks Rice or a book that, that we feel strongly about for whatever reason. And that's great because the stories that have meaning for us are the stories that likely will engage the kids and, and have meaning for them. And we're not just storytellers telling stories. When we do our, our read alouds, and please, I'm not talking about data-driven read alouds here, I'm talking about sharing the joy and the love of reading. But when we do this, we are going to engage the kids and ultimately they'll be in flow state, they'll be excited. And most kids can relate to hats or caps, if it was caps for sale we're reading, or Aunt Flossie's hats, Kids like to wear hats and we could do all kinds of things with hats as well. So let's see what else did I pick out this morning? Oh, this is good. So thinking about phonemic awareness, the sounds of the language, what did I, what did I pick out? Oh, I picked out a, a favorite, Froggy Gets Dressed. And I believe in teaching and using nonsense words only at the beginning. Once we get past um, a reader, a new language learner uh, who has been using uh, just the sounds, I wanna make sure we start using correct models and we don't keep it up. Everything should be correct models. But for the beginning with the sounds of the language, I'm, I'm down for uh, things like this, uh, where Froggy's out there and he's putting on his socks and he goes, zoop. And then he pulled on his boots and he said, zoop. And he put on his hat and he said, zat. And then he tied on his scarf and he said, zwit. Now I'm okay with that because they're learning that sounds make letters and letters make words. But once we get past the beginning stages where it's starting to make sense, then I don't wanna be using any incorrect models. I also wanna start right from the beginning by saying I am, um, adamantly opposed to uh, seat work that scrambled words, word searches, um, uh, crossword puzzles. These don't teach skills. We need to be active with our voices, with our bodies. Okay, so here's a classic. Jesse Bear, Jesse Bear, what will you wear? So you can hear when we're reading to new readers of any age that we wanna have some rhyme, rhythm, and predictable patterns. 
And we also get prediction in many of these younger books. Uh, the young, young books are not necessarily just for young kids. I don't consider it baby at all. If I'm working with an adult um, non-reader or a high school student who has to go back and uh, kind of start over, it, it's okay, it's all right. And they'll have fun with it. So if you have a brown bear, the kids all know brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? And so we're making predictions. And as we go, they're hearing rhyme, rhythm and predictable patterns. Another great book for um, using stories to teach reading would be as simple as Jesse Bear. And in Jesse Bear, what will you wear? It has all kinds of rhyming and then it gets into word families as well. And I'll be telling you more about that. So the mama bear says, Jesse Bear, Jesse Bear, what will you wear? What will you wear in the morning? So you hear the rhythm of reading and a lot of times I use, uh, uh, might be a pencil tapping. Um, this morning I pulled out a tambourine. So the point is we want the kids to feel the rhyme, the rhythm and predictable patterns. So Jesse Bear says, my shirt of red pulled over my head, over my head in the morning. I'll wear my pants, my pants that dance, my pants that dance in the morning. So new readers need rhyme, rhythm and predictable patterns. And it doesn't matter to me whether we're talking about a, a child's child or a very young child, or we're looking at um, new readers and, and non-readers, uh, readers from a second language as well. They'll all work. Now I have a really cool book that I pulled to uh, give you some ideas about punctuation. And also it had some uh, basic um, alphabet, which we're gonna be getting to next. So this book is uh, oh, just one of my favorites. Yo, yes, I've done it so many classes with so many age levels. And it's really cool because right here, you've got um, a long O sound, you've got a short E and yes, and then we've got punctuation marks. So just for fun with kids, I've taken uh, simple paper plates and just put, have the kids put, or I put a, a period, a question mark, or an exclamation, and as the teacher, I can be saying, okay, well, what was that? And then they have to hold up the correct paper plate. So it's very active. Um, I think it's really important that we involve kids' hands a lot more than we do now, that we use the whole physicality, the whole body and teaching reading at all, at all levels. And if we're looking at a book like this, just a simple book, I'm also going to be making sounds. So like uh, exclamation might be click or a period might go mm, and a question mark might go. Whoo. So you could really make almost a symphony in your class. And it's just so much fun to uh, use this book for basic punctuation. And what's really neat about Yo Yes is that they end up becoming friends. And that's what it's all about. You need a friend, no friends. I'll be your friend, okay. So this is really a terrific book for, for your young children. I also always look for uh, multi-ethnic books and books that will uh, appeal to everybody. Now, when we start off, we said that we start with phonemic awareness and most of the people that we're talking about right now aren't gonna be right at phonemic awareness level where they just don't even know the sounds. And I'm saying, uh, well, if that uh, sounds like the other one, point to your head. If it sounds like that word, uh, point to your shoulders or wiggle your hips or shake your bottom. So I'm gonna be real, real active with them as we're working on the sounds. And I might be, uh, I'm not a good singer, but I might be singing something like um, to do some substitution. Um, uh, let's say uh, B-A-B, -B, and then you say B-A-B, B-E-B, B-I-B, B-I-B, B-I-B. Yeah, bye to bye. Yo, bo, bye to bye, bye, boo, boo. You know, that doesn't drive you crazy. The kids will really love it. So it's lots of fun to sing and to chant and to use our hands and our, and our voices and our bodies. Now, you won't be able to see me do all that while I'm sitting here literally on a little uh, stool, but I'm going to do the best I can. Now, I want to talk to you about the alphabet in the English language. So 
you know, why did I not pull that card? Um, here they are. You know that the alphabet in English has 26 letters. So what I do for teaching the alphabet and teaching uh, for the English language is I start with uh, the consonants that are more regular. They don't change. They, they sound the same all the time. Uh, an example might be uh, a B, but we don't say B. We say B, not B, but we say B. So as I go through the alphabet, I'm going to see that there are some letters that don't always sound the same. Uh, I always start with the consonants, but as soon as I can, I get into the vowels so that I can start making words. So for example, uh, the letter S, sometimes S can sound like S, sometimes it sounds like a, a Z, like the word, uh, you know, easy. Sometimes a C can sound like a hard C, like K. Sometimes it's a, a soft C, like city. Okay. What about Y? Y can have three sounds. It can sound like uh, city, can sound like cry, ka -ka sound. Um, and uh, see, there's something else and I can't even think about it. So I'm just going to move on and later I'm going to go bang, bang, bang. How come I couldn't think of it? So anyway, Y has um, three sounds. All right, so let's see. S and Y have different sounds. G can sound like a hard G or a soft G. Go or George. So if I start with the letters that are the most regular of the consonants, and then I teach those letters that can change a little bit, then the student is much better off. Now, I do teach upper and lowercase together but you don't have to do it that way. And in any event, I do start with the regular consonants and then I add in the ones that have more than one sound. Now, um, to have copies of all this, uh, it is in, in, in my books and I'm not here to sell my books today. I just don't have it all on paper for you. Um, so, um, so I, I just don't have it that way for you. So moving along, we've got, um, the vowels are going to come next after we do the consonants or again as close as you can because you can't make a word without having the vowels in there. So let's say our vowels would be A E I O U, right? And then let's go uh, long vowels. So I can go A is in table and then E might be eat, I is I, O is open or whatever words you want. And then U is in universe or unicorn. Okay. But what about the short sounds? Oh, I need something to help me and help these kids remember. I know. I can do at as in back, it as in leg, it as in lip, uh as in not, and uh as in up. Wow. I've got some sounds now that I can work with and I can start putting those together into words. So there's many, many books for uh, learning those basic sounds and uh, mastering the alphabet. We can also use body parts as we're working on alphabet. Um, the only one I concern, I would be concerned about is arm because you've got a bossy R there, not a, not a pure uh, A sound. So that one I wouldn't do, but I might do leg for E uh, again, or if or lip or uh, for head, put your head, um, that sort of thing, all right? So the book I picked uh, to show this morning was Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. The learning station has a boom, chicka boom, chicka boom. And so the kids like to do that along with this. But what's really fun with Chicka ABC is not only does it rhyme and do such a great job with the alphabet, but what I've done with kids is we've made a tree in the corner of the room and we put words on that match the letters of the alphabet. So it, a little bit, if you haven't heard it, it just starts a told B and B told C, I'll meet you at the top of the coconut tree. Now I'm doing a lot of choral response with kids. They're either gonna have an instrument in their hand or they're gonna be tapping. They need that rhyme, that rhythm, that repetition. And they need also to involve the whole physiology, the a total physical response I believe is is the way to go that our whole body is learning these sounds and letters and turning them into words. But this is a, this is a really neat first start book. Chicka boom boom.
you know, until I fall over my pile of books so I don't get out of order here. Uh, let's see, what did I bring in? Oh, I wanted to do some things with you for the vowels that might be different. And so uh, when we looked at a, 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 a for our vowels, then there's also some other things that are gonna be different and easy. And one would be to teach you the magic E or the jumping E. Now my bet is you've already done this before, heard about it, but perhaps you have not. So in my books, especially the new one coming out, it has all the patterns to do the things I'm showing you today. This book is a really fun book. There are lots of books about telling time, but I like this one because it has a magic E there. We've got Tim with a short vowel and then we put E. So here's what I say. E on the end makes the first vowel long. You say that with me? E on the end makes the first vowel long. And I'm kind of backwards, so we'll do it again. E on the end makes the first vowel long. And that holds up. Now, when I do the magic E and we find it in books or around the room, we know there's three kinds of print. There's functional print, there's dramatic play print, and there's environmental print. So we wanna make sure we have those prints in our classroom and schools wherever we are. I made a point today, I'm basically sitting in front of part of one of my teaching closets. We can teach anywhere. We can teach under the tree, which I have. We can teach in a nook or a cranny. We can teach holding a chalkboard. Technology is, is the best, but not all the children have access to technology, but they may have access to scratch paper and crayons. And I can do an awful lot with scratch paper and crayons. And here's an example of what we might do to show how to teach a magic E. Now, again, this is old school. This is before teacher paid teachers. I came up with a lot of things that I used in seminars all over the country in classrooms and everybody goes, gee, I want that, I want that. Well, I can see why, look what happens here. So we have our short vowels. Every syllable has to have a short vowel in it to be a syllable. So let's go together, cub, pin, shin. By the way, kids, you know where your shin is? Point to me, show me your shin. Yes, that's your shin, okay? And then what do we have? We have fad, plan, kit, mop, cap, hit, and cut. Well, that looks great, but looks what, look what happens, kids. If we do this, the E on, oops, wrong one. The E on the end makes the first vowel long. So now what do we have? Cub becomes Q. Let's do another one. We have a pin. Today I have on my read pin. But if I add an E on the end, I've got pine. What about shin? Oh, look, we've got a digraph. If you haven't heard of a digraph before a class, let me just say this. Digraph is two letters, one sound. What is it? Two letters, one sound. Um, whenever two letters are hanging around, a digraph only makes one sound. Whenever two letters are hanging around, digraph makes one sound. Sh, sh, like sheep and ship, sh, sh, like notches and cheese. Whenever two letters are hanging around, a digraph makes one sound. Wow, we got an introduction to a digraph. It just showed up. Now I have fad, 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 fad. But if I put the e on the end, what happens? E on the end makes the first vowel long. Kids get into sing song and chants. Um, I had a, um, a story, I'll stop uh, for a second and tell you. I was teaching Leo the Late Bloomer to a class in Southern California a number of years ago now. And they really got into uh, the onomatopoeia. Hiss, boom, bam, onomatopoeia. So I said to the class over and over, and they did with me, onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia. And I went back to that school a couple months later, and here I am walking down the hall, Mrs. Wirtz, W-I-R-T-Z, and they used to call me Mrs. Words because they couldn't say words all the time. So I'm walking down the hall of that school, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of kids and they start yelling all the way down the hall and they're going, onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia. 
And so I said to the teachers, did you guys go back and teach on a Matapia? You know, we know Ebbinghaus Curve says they only remember this time and a little of this time. We know they remember best primacy, recency, what they heard first, what they heard last. We know we have to rehearse the middle. We know we want to teach set close, set close, set close. Uh, but you must have done something. And you know what they said? They didn't do a thing. It made such an impact. It's called the von Restorff effect. What's unusual stands out. And I am definitely unusual. And I always have been. So when I did onomatopoeia with them, they remembered. I didn't have to do another thing. They remembered it. And they could tell me what the onomatopoeia was. So finishing, look at this. We've got a blend that popped up. So we have P-L-A-N. So right now we have a sound. A is in back. Okay, I can remember that short sound because I knew it was back. I've got an attachment there. But I've got a PL. <gasps> it's a blend. What if the kids don't know what a blend is? And if we're using a reading program, that's fine. Whatever programs you use and you like, that's fine. But we still have to know how to teach the skills. And we should be able to do other things that will add on and help them remember. If a blend came up in their reading, that's great. But that's when I want to teach all the blends so they know what a blend is. PL, PR, GR, blends. You take two words, but you hear both. It's a little different. So you hear ba -o, pa -o. you hear two sounds. So blend is two letters with two sounds. And then you can have a three letter blend like the word strike. S-T-R, strike, or streganona, which I'll show you the book because we're teaching reading through stories today. Okay, S-T-R. So a two-letter blend has two sounds, clap, clap. And a three-letter blend has three sounds, clap, clap, clap. Let's do it again. A two-letter blend has two sounds, clap, clap. A three-letter blend has three sounds, clap, clap, clap. Got it? Okay. Since I can't see you nodding your head, I'm going to say, hey, got that. All right. So we have kit becomes kite. We have mop becomes mope. Now we're acting out mop, limpia mucho. We're cleaning with the mop. The kids are moving their arm, helps them remember. But then we hit E on the end makes the first vowel long. And now we have mope. So kids, show me mope. What do you do when you're moping? Oh, I don't feel good. I'm hoping. All right. So a letter can make a huge difference in meaning, can't it? Yes. And then we have uh, cap. Oh boy. Caps for sale, 50 cents. And then I've got a cape. So I'm going to put my cape on right now. Okay. Got my cape on. And then I have hid, hide, and I have cut, cortar to cut in Spanish. And then, oh boy, well, I'm pretty old to be cute, but that's what we get, we have cute. So this is pretty cool. Now, uh, if you've seen this somewhere else, uh, that would be uh, pretty interesting because I think I invented this a long, long time ago, but it doesn't matter. Everything gets shared in education, so I'm happy to share it. Did you like that one? Just nod your head, yes. Yay. Yes, it's like also one? for teaching pronunciation. I'm sorry? It's also interesting uh, to use this one Teach yes. Yeah, there's so it's it's a fun way to it's really a fun way to teach. And we're going to use lots of uh reinforcement too. Whenever you teach a skill, if we're going right down the phonics list of what we need to teach, you know, the consonants, the uh the vowels, and then we're going to get the uh, the um, I don't want to start by teaching except exceptions. I will point out a schwa though, because a word like elephant. Uh, I will say a schwa, but otherwise I don't start by teaching exceptions. I teach general rules. And phonics has been said to be between 65 and 85% uh, high utility. So we want to teach the high utility generalizations. Uh, the more that they feel, kids feel comfortable, young adults feel comfortable, uh, the faster that they're going to be reading. So uh, I'm gonna stop for a second and, and talk about that just for a minute. I'm gonna go out of place a little bit. I'd like you to humor me just for a second and I'd like you guys to put your fingers up like this. And I want you to soften your gaze right now, kind of looking between or over your fingers. 
Now, can you see both your fingers in front of you? And you'll say, yes, Rita, okay. Now, if we move our fingers to here, can you still see both fingers? Yes. If we move them to here, how about here? How about here? Now, I'm not gonna turn my head, I'm gonna look straight. Can I still see my fingers? Yes. And some kids would say to me in adults, I can see my fingers way out here. Well, then why do we read one word at a time? We can read more, but when we stop, it's called an eye stop or fixation. And the more that the kid's eyes stop on that line of print, then they won't remember what they read and it'll go slower and slower and slower. A lot of kids are they're reading right here. Then they make a regression. Then they make another fixation or an eye stop and then they go backwards. So I like to look at kids' eyes. So while I'm doing phonics and phonemic awareness, I am still always working them on the mechanics of reading, uh, whether it's print awareness and A is an A, whatever position it's in. I'm working on the print awareness, how to hold a book, how to handle a book, how to use a book the way good readers in quotes do. It's not just, I'm gonna teach them one skill, oh, here's a blend and then we'll move on and we forget it. It's all gonna keep spiraling and integrating. And what we're doing is this, we are not in a position of saying that when we're reading that, um, okay, uh, that's, that's that way um, and that's that way. No, it's gonna, it's gonna merge and, and mix a lot more. And if we say we're not gonna do queuing anymore, queuing is no more, queuing is no more. Does it look right? Does it sound right? Does it make sense? Well, why? There are kids who aren't gonna know if it looks right, the, the, the semantics, the graphophonics and the syntactics. Uh, they may not know if it looks right, it sounds right or it makes sense. So it's not gonna work for them, but that's just one thing I'm gonna do. So while I'm making sure that they know the alphabet, they know the sounds of the alphabet, they're able to start blending uh, letters into words and words into sentences and sentences, et cetera. Along the way, I'm watching their eyes and seeing whether I need to do some tracking practice with them and make sure that they are starting to see larger amounts of print, the more skills that they're getting. Uh, mechanics of reading is almost never talked about. Um, I can do another thing before we move on where I'm just going to take my finger and bring it in. Uh, you could use a pencil, not sharp, under a pen. But for our purpose right now, I'm going to take my finger and bring it in and take it out. This is going to help my eyes uh, focus. Binocular focus is important and perceptual skills are important. And, and the mechanics is very important, but very, very little is taught, if anything, in teacher prep courses. They don't, they don't do that. So if we're going to be teaching about the sounds of the letters and the alphabet and all these things happening, I'm also going to make sure that those kids aren't getting stuck one letter or one word at a time. I'm going to be working to get their span bigger. I want them to be able to see more. And as we get to older kids, in fact, beyond that, I'm going to teach them to be able to look over the lines of print, to use a crisscross to see the page. But these are not there yet. These kids are not there yet. So that gives us something to look forward to. All right, so what else did I pull in here? Oh boy, I pulled uh, one of my Stregononas. Now I think that I pulled, well, let's see, we got our little puppet here today too. I love to use puppets. I have lots of finger puppets and puppets. It's not baby, kids love puppets. So I picked Streganona out just because many people know this and then Streganona meets the match. And the reason I picked this one is we were talking about blends that came up. And this one has an example of a three letter blend, a three letter blend. There you go. You hear them all, you hear the sounds in it. It's different, the digraph, you only hear one sound but the blend you actually hear each sound and it's like blending it into a blender into a new word. So I picked out Streganona to show you that there really are three letter blends out there. So let's, let's talk about where we were so far. We're, we're looking at teaching the, the alphabet and we're gonna start with the real consistent letters and then we'll come back to the G again in a little quick review because it's got a soft and a hard G. Uh, S has more than one sound. Uh, y uh, can be a vowel, it could be a consonant. And we can move into blends and we can move into digraphs. 
and then uh, diphthongs, O-I-O-Y. Oh boy, there's so much to know and it's so exciting. Now, when we, we talk about uh, the sounds that uh, are the consonants, the regular and the irregular and, and the schwa, and then not worrying about uh, words that you see that are a little weird, then you might have to teach those as sight words. Um, I, in my career, have been really blessed that I got to teach with um, initial teaching alphabet, uh, Pittman from England. Um, I taught words in color, I've taught reading mastery. There's probably no reading program that I, that I hadn't taught along the way. Now, when I get asked about reading programs, I, this is a tough one for me. I am not opposed to all reading programs. I'm not even cognizant of the brand new reading programs that keep coming out week after week practically. What I'm most concerned about is teachers should use whatever they want to use or they're asked to use, but we also have to know all the skills. Teacher has to know that uh, those sounds that make letters and letters make words, that there's blends and digraphs and diphthongs and you need to teach what those are so the kids can recognize them more quickly. And then we can work on those other speed uh, skills and rate skills. Because if we don't do that, they're gonna keep going backwards and then they don't remember what they read. So I wanted to talk to you uh, while we're talking about vowel sounds and we said A-E-I-O-U, belong. We said a a a a, -a for the short sounds. And then we know we have some diphthongs, O-I, O-I, et cetera. But we also have a good way to recognize words and that's with the bossy R or R control vowel. So this is an old friend, but it still works. So I chant with kids or the adults, whoever I'm working with, A plus R equals R. And so I did it over here. A plus R equals R, far, car. And then you go E plus R equals er. And then give me a word, her. I plus R is R, like in first. O plus R is or, like in four. U R turns. So it went like this. A plus R equals R. R. So you're going fast with the class, chanting it. E plus R equals er, er. I plus R equals er, er. And there I am, words, W, I, R, T, Z. I've got that blend right there in my name. What a way to start. O plus R equals or. U plus R equals er. And these are called bossy R or vowel plus R or R control vowels, so all the same thing. So if I know those, then when I see a new word, and it doesn't matter whether I'm in third grade or I'm in high school, one of the things I can do is see, whoa, I can pick out that word because it has a bossy R in there. And one of my favorite books, Market Street, it's got one right in there. And, and I can be going through with the kids and finding them. Oh, look at that. And it has that three letter blend again. So I can absolutely do A plus R equals R and they get it. Uh, what did I pick this one for? Oh, I love this book. Um, Say the ben Bengal Tiger. I really like it because it's got teamwork, which is a nice compound word in here. And then we've got, of course, the ER for tiger. Okay, and I'm wondering if we see anything else that you want to know. The uh, sight word. So this is a really, really good book. So there, there's trade books and classics. I don't care. Uh, it's about Maslow, then Dewey, then Bloom. And if a student wants to read Captain Underpants or they want to read uh, Mrs. Noodle Poogle or, um, oh gee, what, what's new, new? Uh, Dog Man, um, nonfiction, I want to mix it up. Classics and nonfiction, poetry. Uh, I had pulled, you can't see it, but I've got fables and Charlotte's Web pulled and uh, some old folk tales. So, I want genres, I want them to be exposed to everything. But as they're doing that, I'm still teaching decoding because if they can't decode or recognize new words, whatever level they are, then they're gonna be behind and they won't know what they read, they won't remember it. And that's why as we're working with the sounds of the language and putting them together and pulling them apart, we're also always aware that kids can see more than they thought. And if they're looking and reading one word at a time, uh, it's going to show up on their fluency test. Again, I'm, I'm 
not happy with fluency tests is very stressful to children and it does not tell me what they really know. Again, these are my opinions. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm right. Not always, <laughs> not always, just kidding. Oh boy. So, um, and when we're looking at vowels and we're looking at our language, uh, it's all still part of phonics. Phonics has got a, a lot to it when people say, Oh, I don't want to teach phonics. I love to teach phonics. Phonics is one of my favorite things. And when we look at balanced literacy and we said, oh, balanced literacy, no more, no more, because it didn't teach phonics. It was just uh, code versus meaning, and it was all about meaning. That's not true. I was originally a whole language teacher. I love language experience, and it works great for kids uh, learning second languages when they tell the story and we write it down with them, and then we read it back but we have to know what these phonic skills are. And many, many teachers never took a reading class. I was blessed to teach secondary reading and content in K-12 uh, reading for years and years and years in California for Sac State, National, and uh, uh, Sac, uh, I'm sorry, Chapman University. I also taught school administration, but what was really fun was the reading. So let's take a look and see, why did I pull these out? Uh, let's see here. Oh, oh, okay. I was looking at um, word families. So word families are uh, a great way to teach. It doesn't, uh, when I, uh, let me go backwards. When I was teaching in the uh, border towns, um, San Isidro in particular in California, border of Mexico, uh, uh, my Spanish was a little bit better than that it is now. Uh, but uh, I went to do word families with a class one day and teacher says, well, you know, it won't translate, but I, I think we can use, use them anyway. So with a word family, it's pretty simple. We have what's called the onset. It's the beginning of the word. And then the word family is the ending. So in this case it would be A-I-N. So let's think for uh, A-I-N, we could have pain, gain, rain, stain. And we can make a lot of different word families from A-I-N. I love the book Rain. Eugene gets a lot of rain. And this book has um, a lot of color and then it repeats the word rain all the way through it. So it's really cool. But that's just a, one example of a word family. Now, um, another word family uh, is cats. This book was written in about 1929. It's probably one of the oldest trade books in America that's still read. It's Newberry um, Winter. It's a wonderful, wonderful story about cats, but why I liked it, of course, was it had the AT word family. And I can do lots of fun things with word families. I can turn them into wallets. I can turn them into pop-up flashcards. Um, uh, I can do four box folds. I can do eight box folds. I could do something like this, where I took an old cake box and I'm with the class and I say, okay, on a, this scrap of paper, I want you to, uh, write down as many words as end in A, K, E, that word family, and then we'll put them in the box and let's see what we get out for our dessert. And boy, they were throwing in make and take and bake and rake and sake. So uh, it's really fun just to just to use any kind of little prop or something that you have. So I think that kids really, really like and appreciate uh, props and musical instruments and stuff from around the house. Again, actuals, realia, whatever you have or just the simplest thing like this that comes in your head and you can have kids make, um, make a box or whatever that you want for them to put their word families in. So that's a pretty cool thing. Now, what was this? Oh, not very good. Uh, I taught my granddaughter from March to June um, on house party and FaceTime uh, in this room on the floor. She lived 10 minutes away, but I wasn't there. This got a little folded up, but it was a, a pop-up flashcard we meant that we made and the word was collaborative. And uh, when Morgan came up with collaborative, she knew what it meant. And I said, well, let's just make a pop-up. So I did that real fast and I didn't realize I stuck that in there. That wasn't very firm. Let's see, what else do I have here? Mm, so in structural analysis, we have compound words. Okay, we have word families, we have prefixes, we have suffixes, we have contractions. That's the main ones. 
and structural analysis, the structure of the English language is still part of phonics to me. So what did I pull for this? Let's see, for contractions. Hmm. Oh, one of my favorite books, Leo the Late Bloomer. Not only does it have onomatopoeia in here, I'll show you that since I already went out of order here. Where'd it go? Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, come on, Rita. I need too many tags in this or too many good pages. Uh. Here we go. Here's what onomatopoeia looks like. Thrump, hook, hiss, crunch, pip. So, so I've got onomatopoeia and Leo and Leo, I can teach a lot of reading skills from this book because it has contractions like couldn't, okay? Could not. Now, when I teach contractions, I teach regular contractions. I would not start with a word like will not, won't, because it's not uh, what I'm gonna show you, how easy this is. Now, this is what I do to teach contractions with kids or young adults. Here we go. Now, I know you're facing me, so I would be the other way. So it goes like this. You take the letter out, then you put the apostrophe in. Okay, we'll do it again. You take the letter out, then you put the apostrophe in. For example, I made a, contract, a contraction condo. So here's um, an easy one, is not. So I had is not, and you could reverse it. So isn't, is not. And then I have I'm, okay, I am. I've got we're, we are. I've got he's, he is. And the kids like to make it. All they need is scratch paper, construction paper, and you just cut, cut, cut. Don't cut it all the way across, obviously, or it'll cut it off. But you can do um, any contractions that you want to like this for the kids. And uh, I'm not big on worksheets. So I prefer reading manipulatives. We have math manipulatives, but very few reading manipulatives. So I've made it part of my task and my uh your last years of my life to make sure that I show lots of different ways. And today I'm just showing you a few in my books. It's got all the patterns and things that you can do. Now, uh, these, I have a stack. I just pulled one. These were contraction t-shirts that I made one time. So these were all in a pile and the kids got to get the hose pins that match. So the back said, do not. And the front says, don't. And so the kids found the correct do not and they clip it so they're contraction t-shirts and then we play games with it so simple simple this is old old school stuff like when i was first learning how to be a teacher and we've gotten so far away with uh, uh our use of uh, reading programs and i'm not again putting down reading programs i really love my uh, granddaughter's journeys her fourth grade book but it's not enough. It's just not enough. We need to do more to engage our kids and get them to flow. I'm so concerned by the amount of kids who aren't reading. And why aren't they reading? What have we not done that would encourage them? We certainly model. We come in with our own metacognition and say, boy, I just read this really great book today that I want to tell you about. And then we do read alouds and we make sure we have time for kids to read. I want kids to read at their level, but I'm not really into level books either. If kids want to read a book that's harder uh, or uh, more challenging than maybe where they are, great, but I'm going to scaffold it like crazy. And instead of long readability formulas, I just do my five finger technique. When they get the book, they put down a finger every time they see where they didn't know. One finger. Another word I didn't know, two, three, four, five, pretty much. But if they still want to read the book, I'm going to scaffold to help because that's a book that they chose. And interest is more important to me than anything. That just right book will make the difference. And all of a sudden, the kid who wasn't reading finds it. And it might be from online or, or a, an audio book. It could be a graphic novel, might be poetry, it might be fables. It could be anything. And all of a sudden, that aha. Um, this year, our, our daughter got, granddaughter got into the Babysitter's Club, 
And she hadn't been reading that much anymore either. Everything was just online and Roblox and video games since school was out. And uh, a, a lot of reading, but not really into it. And then all of a sudden, boom, radiator, whoop, hit, babysitter's club, and that was it. Now, um, another element of structure of our language would be syllables, syllabication. This hits everybody, all ages and stages need to know how to do syllables. In my books, I have syllable rules and syllable ideas, but some easy things for me for syllables. And if you went anywhere in the country, I would bet you today that teachers are gonna do the same way. If I say, how many syllables? So what could we do? We can clap them, we can finger snap them, we can stamp it with our feet, uh, we could pat our head, uh, anything we could do with that. But the book that I picked this morning for syllables was Tiki Tiki Tambo. This is a terrific classic, which you may or may not have had in your library. And I love this for a couple of reasons. One is that the kids aren't behaving in the story and they're learning a life lesson about why it's important. Don't go into that well. And then the other thing, of course, is the name. So I'm going to give you a little check here and I'm going to read the name of the boy and then we're going to count the syllables and we'll see if we all come out the same. So I'm going to show you the long version in here just so you get a kind of an idea and then I'm going to go like this. Here we go. Count with me, use your fingers. Ticky, ticky, tambo, no saw, rambo, cherry, rary, pushy, pip, peri, tambo. And it's actually 21. Now I'm going to read it right from the book, make sure I got it exactly right. And you count too. And I think you're going to get 21. So here it goes. In a small mountain village, there lived a mother who had two little sons. Her second son, she called Chang. And Chang meant little or nothing, it wasn't very good. But her first and honored son, she called, here we go. Tiki, tiki, tambo, no saw, rambo, cherry, berry, rushi, pip, peri, pambo, which meant the most wonderful thing in the whole wide world. So we counted that out, we get 21 syllables. Isn't that amazing? In this book, we also have contractions too. So most of the time, the uh, stories that you pick to read with your kids, whether they're brand new stories or old classics, you'll see there are literary elements. And today we're mostly looking at uh, decoding or recognizing new words. Uh, we're not as into, at this point anyway, the meaning of it. We're working on the code piece of the pie. So ticky ticky tambo, syllables, have a blast. Okay, now what else did I put in here? This is getting kind of interesting. Hmm, oh, I wanted to show you a couple compound words. Um, I showed you everybody cooks rice, but I wanna make sure that we are on the same wavelength here. I don't like to do compound words when I'm first instructing it that are an anybody and anything I want it to be um, actuals and real. So I just happened to grab then Pete the Cat and the magic sunglasses and where's our compound word? Sunglasses, right? So sunglasses, you take two words and you splash them together. So if we're doing a compound word, what's the chant? You take two words, then you squash them together. And I have lists of those, but I can also do reading manipulative. And again, it could be cardboard, whatever scrap paper you have or the kids have at home, or this will give you an idea of something you might be able to just do online. So here's one that I made. So the word was lipstick. Okay, so I just did a, this was just a simple fold. And then inside I've got the two words that make lipstick. So I've got, what's the word? Lipstick, what two words make it? Lip and stick. Kids love to do this. I've done this with high school kids and they like it. I can also do a compound word with a fold like this. So I've got what? I've got sunflower and then I open it up and I got the word sunflower. Wow, 
it seems so simple to me. I don't know. I'm wondering if you've done some things like this, but I'm not getting uh, answers back from you yet this morning. So I hope that that was fun. Did you like that one, Aziz? Kind of, kind of cool, huh? Let's see, what else did I put in here? Wow, I really feel, this was from a teddy bear picnic that I was setting up. Oh, wow. So let's see where we are on, on the structure first. Oh, okay. So for structural analysis, well, let's go back into phonics. So when we're talking about phonics, we're talking about, we started with the, the phoneme or the basic sounds, and then we're moving on into phonics. So we know we've got the alphabet, we have long and we have short. We have um, uh, sounds that can be more than one sound. We talked about that several times. And then when we're talking about phonics, we're also looking at uh, vowels that might be a bossy R, R control vowel. Uh, we might do a vowel team, that's E, A, E, E, O, A, et cetera. So vowel teams come right in there. We had our short and we're our long, so let's see. So we keep going and we're going the structure too. That's under, I guess I put that with phonics. So then I've got what? I've got uh, compound words. I've got contractions. I've got syllables. And then for prefixes and suffixes, oh boy, I have a great time with prefixes and suffixes. And I've been in junior and senior high classes and stood up with the kids and I go, well, let's see, let's take a look at that word and I go, and uh, one thing that you can do is have kids just hold up a card, a P and an S, prefix and suffix. So for a choral response, I go, here we go. So I lean. Now, again, you're facing me, so it'll be different. So I go, prefix comes be, let me get it right, <laughs> prefix before and suffix after. Okay, class, what is this? I know. And then they say it, choral response, prefix before, suffix after. So then we go back up and I'm looking, oh, so it's uh, under da 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 or submarine. Oh, I know, sub means under, marine is water. So it's under the water. And I'm always using my hands to show under the water. In fact, in Tiki Tiki Temple, there's a, a scene where uh, there's like a near drowning of the little boy, Anthony. And so, or, or um, anyway, so he goes, uh, uh, they get to the old man, the old man comes back and they go, we're going to push the water into him and pull the water out of him, push the water into him and pull the water out of him. So whatever I'm teaching, whatever the phonics element um, or comprehension piece, I'm always using my hands, my body, we're singing, we're chanting, it might be a rap, might be a poem, it might be artwork, we're going to be writing. We know that it's reading, writing, speaking, listening, but the five actual components of reading are what we said, phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, uh, fluency, and comprehension. Those are considered the five major elements. All right, I'm gonna take a quick little drink here. Is this, you, you have any question before I move to this next little piece here? You mentioned predictable patterns. You mentioned the rhythm the rhyme and predictable pattern. Yes. What do you mean by yes. predictable pattern? Well, it'd be the same like uh, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Or Jesse bear, Jesse bear, what will you wear? What will you wear in the morning? My shirt of red goes over my head, goes over my head in the morning. So you could feel it or uh, literally, depending what you have, I might be Jesse Bear, Jesse Bear. Okay. I might use an instrument. I might use a clavis. I might use um. Uh, what else did I put in here? Um, a maraca. Okay. I might be having. It's reading is rhythmic. Reading is rhythmic. I can also use. If you still have access, I can still use a metronome. If you have access to a metronome, these will really still help kids with a. Um, the rhyme, rhythm, and the beat. So uh, uh, think creatively. What do you have around the house? What do you have in your classroom or where, wherever you're teaching? Uh, it's very important that we engage kids. Um, they're they're going to tune out otherwise. And we want to get them engaged and, again, to flow. 
Now, the whole reason we want them reading, of course, is to be responding to what they're reading and, and we want them to be able to write and tell us about what they did. But we still have to know the basic decoding or word recognition skills. And these are what I've gone through in maybe a little different fashion. So um, kind of kind of interesting to think that I know a lot, but there's more to know. Uh, Rita. Yes. There is a there is a uh, question here for you. Okay. From the audience. They want to know the technique or the strategy teachers can use to summarize the stories. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. The question is, uh, what can teachers do to summarize stories? Oh, uh, to to be writing after the reading. Yes, it's, maybe it's it's kind of a combination between two. Stories. Oh, it's absolutely all the time, and so um, I have uh, kids. Uh, write, write one, one line what you just got, or uh, let's summarize what you just got, or let's take it apart paragraph by paragraph what you just got and we'll write about it. Uh, it's always write in, it's always write in with reading. We want them to write about their experiences uh, before, during, and after. There's always a writing element in there, absolutely. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, reading and uh, reading and writing are go together is absolutely. Um, you asked me last time we were together about why I didn't focus on writing. And I told you the truth that I am a professional writer and author. I started out to be a, a writer and, and instead ended up a high school English teacher, speech and drama, which was great. And then went on uh, to do reading, get my reading masters, et cetera, and teach reading for many, many years. But uh, the bottom line is uh, I stopped teaching English, high school English, because the kids couldn't read. You know, if they couldn't read and they couldn't read the literature and they couldn't write, then I had to go back and get myself better educated. And that was the beginning of my uh, lifelong uh, journey into the field of reading. Also, I didn't mention for a number of years, I was a program evaluator for Arizona and then California Department of Corrections, the Title I program people didn't realize then that Title I meant not just kids in public schools, it was kids in other uh, home settings or uh, incarcerated settings. And the goal was, since they were under 21, to help them learn to read and therefore hopefully they wouldn't be recidivists. So for about 11 years, I did that, traveling to all the uh, prisons, uh, except for Folsom. Um, they didn't have under 21 year old inmates, but uh, for both states, I was able to go and teach with teachers and that was a really <laughs> interesting time in my life. Now I can't believe that I did that. So yeah, everybody, everybody needs to know how to read. And I'm not gonna go through the test scores. Um, I'm very opposed to standardized tests, all of them. Um, I do like the, the NAEP, it's not being given this year, the uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress. And the reason I like that is it's the nation's report card and it gives us a good snapshot. But if we were to look at the NAEP, other than this year not being given, we see that uh, too many kids um, at fourth grade level are way, way behind. They're uh, not even all at basic level. So I'm concerned that while we're talking so much about learning loss, that uh, the opinion that I've been saying on podcasts and Twitter and all over the place is that I think we need to stop worrying about learning loss and talk about excellence in teaching and things that we can do to bring kids up really fast. And it's going to take some, some serious review of skills. I don't see how in the world you'd catch up going back lockstep through a reading program and then testing them this year. It seems insane to me. I, I can't believe there'd be any testing. Worse than that, or, or more than that, having been a school principal and a teacher of administration for many years, uh, I wouldn't be doing teacher evaluation. I, I'm not telling you this, but I wouldn't be evaluating teachers this year. Uh, I think that it's really important that we do these extra things to make reading fun and uh, take another look at what book reports may or may not be and whether they can do things uh, uh, with technology to share what they're reading or maybe uh, uh, 
family at home classic reading time or book clubs on Zoom. There's lots of things that we can do while kids are still at home. But we're in a situation where we're looking at hybrid, we're looking at kids in the classroom at the same time as kids at home, we're looking at uh, in and out. We, we all know what we're facing. But my concern is that we're gonna say, everybody's behind. There's so much learning loss. I had written about summer slide several times on, on BAM, uh, uh, writing that I'm concerned that I, I don't, it's not that I don't believe there's a summer slide, but I think that the way we're teaching so locked staff is what's hurting us to begin with, that we need to offer more opportunities for students to be constructivists, uh, owners of their own learning. And so of course I push for project-based learning and uh, passion projects, et cetera. With that being said, I still feel that we need to go back and do some fun, fast, furious reviews of the basic elements of phonics and structure. And then, uh, of course, how to read a book. And we have, and I'm looking at my time, we haven't even gone there today. Uh, you suggested that we do two sessions and I am total agreement today. I thought if we do some issues with uh, decoding, uh, issues that have come up because people weren't sure what to do now, there's too big, there's too much. They feel too behind. and. I've got kids that were already on all different levels and then here they are going to come back and you've got kids that weren't in school kids that didn't do homework kids that weren't there and what are you going to do how can how can you catch them up the old way uh, of just uh, a piece at a time through a reading program i just don't see it happening i really believe that we've got to use our smarts right now and figure out what can we do to engage these kids with uh, reading that they really want to be doing, things that are exciting and interest, but I still like classics and I like whole class novels. There's nothing better than Charlotte's Web or uh, Bridget Terabithia, um, James and the Giant Peach. These are ageless. It's not about a little kid. So um, I think it's all going to go together, but I want teachers to kind of take a sigh of relief that you're not crazy. You've got kids all over the place but it's not because of just learning loss. They weren't in school. They've learned a lot of other things while they weren't in school. So I don't want to look at it like that. And I find it terribly troublesome because then it puts the, the onus, the brunt on teachers to all of a sudden catch up. We're talking thousands and thousands of kids. I just don't see it happening. Uh, if anything, I would prefer to go multi-age and looping, which is what I had suggested we do for, for now, but uh, very few uh, schools did it. They just didn't do it. So you're going to have kids all different levels is what's going to happen in, in the classes. And for that, for that, I'm concerned. But again, my point today was to make that everybody's a reading teacher now. And it doesn't matter whether you're a kindergarten teacher or a preschool teacher or you are teaching reading and content. I am not just a science teacher. I know from teaching high school and then teaching high school uh, credential students uh, reading and content. But if I'm a science teacher, I need to help them access my, my work, whether it's um, with a textbook or we've ditched the books and it's all online. Um, I still need to help them access words that they don't know. And when we get to the vocabulary and we're teaching those words, whether it's detached or embedded, detached, embedded, detached, embedded, I need to practice those words. I need to sing them. I need to say them. I need to write them and I need to use them. So vocabulary is going to be right in there as we're going and also spelling and spelling for me has been problematic getting graded word lists is very, very problematic to me. Uh, what I would prefer to see teachers do if they're going to do that detached and embedded and then I do like five words a, a day and immerse it immerse immersion 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 instead of 20 words a week that they're not, they're using, they're just, it's a graded word list. Uh, it, it's terribly troublesome to me. Uh, but spelling and vocabulary are right in there, they come together. And if, if kids know prefixes and suffixes, then they can pick out a prefix, a suffix, a contraction, it's going to become automatic. The more that you're practicing with them, then it does become automatic. Then you have real automaticity. And the notion of fluency to date has been automaticity, that notion that when they saw a word, they would know the word. 
and they could use the word and spell the word, but that's um, not necessarily the case. Fluency is way more than automaticity. Again, let's go back. We have the eyes land on that line of print, okay? And if the line of print is such that they're here and then they go, again, you're facing me, and they go back, they're regressing, and then they go back, and then they read and they regress. They can't remember what they read. They're not going to remember. And that's why we work on this all together. So it's not like I'm going to say, uh, well, the sounds are, we've already done the sounds. We've covered those. So now we're on to phonics. And then ask people what phonics is, and you're going to get a lot of different definitions about what phonics is anyway. I have always been a phonics teacher even when I was a whole language teacher. And that meaning that I was into the, again, the meaning. So it's facetious for us to say that uh, uh, with science of reading um, now, the balanced literacy is, is gonna go away because it's always been a balanced literacy. And when you have balanced literacy, you are using phonics, you're using the structure, you're using context, you're using every kind of strategy that you can think of there's no one strategy will work and that's why i don't want to get rid of queuing i'm ill prepared to say no more queuing i want queuing does it look right does it sound right does it make sense and if that doesn't work then i want them to know hey i can use context i don't want to throw that out i can see from the rest of the sentence i can get an idea if that didn't work I'm going to look for structural analysis, see what words I know. Is there a little word in that word? I can cross check it. There's so many ways that we can figure out what those unknown words are, but we have to use them. So these are like um, just a few like little extra things that, that, that we might not think about that we could chant it, we could sing it, we could hum it, we can tap it, we can use those words. And I want to make another point. I brought uh, this morning, I just pulled up a couple of uh, books that I had here that were nonfiction. Um, when I'm reading, uh, if I'm reading a, a trade book or I'm reading um, a junior adolescent novel or I'm reading a more grown up novel like The, the Giver, et cetera, uh, many of them are on banned book list, by the way, um, including Bridge to Terabithia. Um, there's another one behind me. Um, oh, I lost it for the minute. I don't want to be looking backward. In any event, many of the books that we thought were really terrific have stayed on banned book, banned book list. So I'm not looking to use um, anything on the banned book list right now. I'm not inviting a, a, an issue. This was a really terrific um, movie if you happen to see The Octopus Teacher. And then a friend uh, happened to give me this book. And when we're reading trade books or we're reading our reading program books with stories and answering the questions, th that's great. But then the other piece of the pie is what do we do with those skills that we've learned that we can apply with nonfiction? And nonfiction in our input text is a little different. Uh, it's still similar. It's still stories that we're gonna get. In this case, I learned all about the octopus. But if I had not seen the documentary, my octopus teacher, I would not have had that schema or that background to know what this was really about. So no matter what they're reading, I always start with schema or I'm gonna hook to what they're gonna do in the lesson. Before I even start the set though, I need to know what they already know about it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it right from um, the anchor piece I'm gonna set it right from the hook. And in this case, wow, I had to look at the table of contents. I looked at the pictures and then I realized that the font was so small I couldn't read the book anyway. And I had to go back to my Kindle. So there you go. So if I'm looking at a book that's a nonfiction book, I'm gonna do similar things that I did with fiction, but I'm also gonna to look to see what it has. For example, the simple um, nonfiction info text um, on volcanoes. No big deal. We've seen so many books like this or use them. But what's cool is that we don't just pick up a book and start reading. We always take a look at the cover, the back cover. We do a book walk. In this case, I see it has a table of contents. The book also has a, 
uh, when I look, it had a glossary in the back so and an index. So I have some ideas before I even start. And then no matter what we're reading, no matter where we're going, prediction is the most important thing of all. Once we have those basic phonics skills down and the, the idea that we can read faster, we can see more in that line of print by some activities that we do and by the recognition that the eyes are stopping and regressing, stopping, regressing, and we're so worried about that kid. Oh my goodness. But what the bottom line is here is that we need to have the skills as teachers to know what we're going to teach those kids and it's all by modeling. And then they need a lot of practice. Taking a breath. And I'm thinking about our time. We've really, uh, wow, we've really zipped. And I had a lot more I want to do. And, uh, but I'm thinking that we ought to talk about uh, any questions that have come up. I, I know sometimes I say things that are a little different than what um, maybe we've been told or taught, but we need to take a really hard look at what our beliefs are right now, because we have kids at so many levels. What are we gonna do to make sure that we help all kids by motivating them, by inspiring them, by reading with them, by our read alouds and not data driven, we need to share the joy and the love of reading because reading is a joy forever. But we do need to know how to teach reading. Everybody's a reading teacher now. So that's uh, where I want to bring it back around the corner. There's nothing in my life that I have enjoyed more than reading. There's nothing in my life that I've enjoyed more than the teaching of reading, whether it was adult ed when I started going with my mom at about 12 or 13 and whether I was uh, teaching for Lawback Literacy, Literacy Volunteers of America, Neighborhood Study Center, whether I put all those into our school, I was principal. While I was principal, I read to kids in the bus line, in the cafeteria, everywhere. So we need to be modeling that love and joy, but we need to know the skills. And it's not enough just to follow the pages in a reading program. We need to know. If a blend comes up, we need to be able to teach the blends. If a bossy R came up, we need to teach what a bossy R is and then teach them all. A plus R equals R, R equals R plus R. And now we have some ways to do it. And we know that we're not cuckoo. We're not crazy. We're just reaching out to kids to bring them in to us. And if it's a graphic novel they want to read, uh, whatever they want to read right now that will get them motivated to read, in most cases, I'm down for it. I want them reading. And I'm heartbroken uh, to see, I think it was two days ago, um, I think it was We Are Teachers on Twitter. It had an article that said like 85, oh, this is so hard to even say it, like 85% of kids weren't engaged. Um, there's only like 35 kids, uh, percent of kids that were engaged in what they were doing with uh, long distance learning, remote learning. And there's been some terrific remote learning that's been going on, depending on what the teachers know and could do. But people are tired. They're exhausted. And so for me, if I can offer one idea today that you go, oh, God, I never thought of that. I never even realized that that's all structural analysis. And yeah, I'm doing all that. And I could pick that out if there's words I didn't know. I can pull words and put them out on that smart board. I can uh, do a running record with a kid instead of doing that, all that assessment. Uh, what Mari Clay did with reading recovery, I love it. I don't want to get rid of the work of Ken Goodman. I don't want to get rid of the people that came before me that had terrific ideas. What I want to do is merge the best of everything. And as a teacher, I want that autonomy to do what I feel is best for my students, our students. And that's where you have to know more. I'm not suggesting everyone go get a master's in reading. I'm not suggesting that everybody just start studying every single thing about reading. I am suggesting that we take a harder look. And if it's a content book, um, or if we're reading and content just online, we need to help kids access 
if we do not teach how to access, then the results we get are gonna be the results we've been getting. And the results, as far as tests, were so low before. No wonder people are worrying about learning loss, but I'm not. Right now, I want the kids to survive this and to come out of it with maybe some ideas of uh, projects that they were competent at, that they enjoyed, that they learned, and those genius projects. Boy, we've got to be doing a lot of genius projects. If we continue to do what we did before, it's the same old thing. If you were doing it, it was working okay, and if it wasn't, we need to get rid of it. I'm strongly suggesting that everybody have a mentor that we work with together. You guys have always helped with me uh, with technology, whether it was learning TweetDeck on, on Twitter or how to use Go, uh, Google Meet or how to use uh, many things I didn't have to use before in my life at my age and stage. But I know stuff that maybe will help fill in some gaps for you guys. And I'm always open then to hearing from you, whether it's um, on Twitter at Rita Works or you can catch me on Facebook or uh, take a look at my books up on Amazon. Again, I'm not here to sell books. I'm here to tell you that I love you for what you're doing. And I'm so proud of everybody. And that would be, I guess. Thank you so my much. For this. Yes, that was a very interesting session. Thank you so much for sharing all these uh, interesting tips uh, about reading. Uh, and uh, you obviously have uh, a lot of passion uh, about reading. So, do you have any 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 any, any final comments, maybe? Um, on uh, Bam Internet Radio, uh, um, I I would encourage people to take a look at my blogs on Bam you know, Radio. Um, I have uh, let's see, 134 up right now, and at least 50 are about reading. And it'll take you through uh, how-to uh, events, and it will take you through basic phonics, phonemic awareness, and just pick a title. And I don't know, Aziz, whether you have a way to uh, uh, post the yes. reading cards that I picked out for you, um, the 17, yes. if there's a way that we just can send me the link, them. and I will post them. Yeah, well, I think that will help people a lot. And also uh, for further questions, um, I'm ready, willing, and able to have people get a hold of me. I have parents that message me a lot that I'm working with, and uh, I, I'll never be too busy that I wouldn't answer somebody who asked the question. And you don't have to agree with everything I said today. I know I'm outspoken, but that's because I've been doing this for so long, and I've seen so many schools and so many classrooms and taught with I can't even tell you, probably a couple thousand people. So I'm just looking at if we're all in this together, then we need to be in this together and figure out what we're going to do come September, because there's a lot of good things that happened that we don't want to lose. So there's some long distance learning, remote learning that was fabulous. And we don't want to lose that. But again, I'm encouraging everybody between now and the fall to take another look at uh, what what gaps might be there in the teacher's own repertoire or what might be done to enrich, to make it so warm, so inviting, so loving. And we, we all have stories, whether it's being in the preschool and bringing seaweed salad or uh, the stories of uh, people that are doing heroic things right now to help others. This is a it's a time of stories. And so the title that you asked was a tremendous title because we not only can teach um, stories as far as the cognitive content and the other piece I didn't go so into today that I'm very uh, proficient with, the comprehension end of the uh, spectrum. But the decoding has to come first, the word recognition. If the kids don't know the words, or how to access the print, how to hold the book, how to turn the pages, how to look and how to do a book walk, regardless of fiction or nonfiction, they are not going to remember as well. And if they are reading one word at a time and you see those eyes going back and back and back, then it would behoove us to do some tracking practice and working to get more uh, print seen at one time. 
Okay, so thank you so much for your generosity. And uh, this was really uh, a great session. And uh, we learned a lot from your ideas. So thank you, Rita. Well, thank you all. And thanks again for inviting me. I uh, decided to do something a little different today. And um, I hope that everybody enjoyed it and tell your friends. And I assume this will be posted on Facebook and we'll have a link. And I just hope that we uh, share it. And I do hope to hear from all of you with uh, your feedback, things that you thought that um, my bet is that you got validated on an awful lot today in this short session. But if you got one really great idea, I, I would like to know that and what that idea was. And, and just thanks and God bless you all. Thanks for coming today and thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.